Okay, it is 3.11 a.m. March 9th, 2021. And today I want to talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect and just something that I think uh, think about a lot as a programmer, which is very broad, I'll get into later. But um, to start off with, the Dunning-Kruger effect is this effect that people think it's a cognitive bias and so like if you google the list of cognitive biases on wikipedia you'll probably find it listed there um and it's a fact which is illustrated by this image uh generally um and you can see that there's like um there's a curve and it has like competence and then confidence and competence and basically what the chart is trying to show is that when people first learn something, they think that they're super great at it, and then they realize that they don't know as much as they thought that they did, and then eventually they come back around to believing that they know, or being confident that they know a lot when they've achieved mastery. Um, and I think that this is interesting because uh, it's entirely not true, um, despite what Google Images will tell you. Because if you, if you Google um, like Dunning-Kruger effect, you'll find this image copied about 6,000 times. And that's just, I just took the first one off Google Images, but there are so many recreations of that image. Um, and it's sort of funny because people thinking that they know what the Dunning-Kruger effect is is a, actually an example of the Dunning-Kruger effect um, in sort of a meta way. But to explain what's wrong is um, people that are starting out learning something almost never believe that they are masters. Like if you sat, sat someone down to play chess, um, they don't think that they are Magnus Carlsen from the start. Like that's just not how it works. They might think that they are better than chess that they are, but they don't just immediately assume that they're masters. That's just not how that works. Uh, which is what that chart is trying to show, right? The chart shows at the at the left side that they think that they are better than, like even the master thinks that they are, right? So he sent someone down to play chess, and they think that they are better at chess than Magnus Carlsen thinks that he is at chess. Um, and what's interesting is that this chart does not show up anywhere in the original paper written by David Dunning and his pal, someone Kruger. Uh, David Dunning is a semi-famous like mathematician sort of dude, um, and I actually know someone that knew David Dunning, and David Dunning found the like the pop psychology version of his chart um, that you find on Google Images. He thought it was super funny because it's not actually what he was trying to illustrate at all. What he was trying to illustrate is this chart, which actually does show up on the paper. Um, and this paints an entirely different story. This story says, or this chart says that whenever you start someone out on a task, they're like on the left side here, the bottom quartile, as he calls it. Um, their perceived ability is above their like actual score if you sat them down to do something. Um, but notably, they don't assume that they are masters, right? They're like vertical um rank which is how like confident um they like they are in the subject their vertical confidence is not higher than that of a master right which is very very different from the other chart which in which their like vertical confidence is much higher than that of a master uh but that's just not how it works all it's saying is that people that are less good at the task tend to overrate, overestimate their ability relative to what they would actually do, but not so much that they like assume that they are masters at their task. And I think that like people use the Dunning Kruger effect in arguments to show like they use it as like mostly as a big word to confuse their opponent and then then they feel smart or whatever um but also like anytime their opponent 
like their person that they're debating or arguing with says that they know a thing or they're like have expertise in something they're like well dunning kruger effect says that you must be stupid at it because you think you're good but you're actually terrible um but that's just not how it works and it should be never be used like that um and it's really annoying to me because i try to tell this to people and they just don't care about it but whatever so yeah the the real dunning kruger effect its use case like what you should be using in, in your arguments with people um the the real reason it exists for the the person that is addressed to is your is the type of people that are like they went skiing once and they think they're decent skiers right the people that go golfing once and then they put like avid golfer on their linkedin profile or whatever the people that go scuba diving twice and then they say like you know decent scuba diver or whatever when really in reality they're just starting out like if they actually were put in like front of some sort of comprehensive test for whatever thing that they is that they think that they're, they're decent at um for whatever thing that they think they're decent at it's a hard sentence um they would not perform that well they, they would perform as if they had just done one of their thing, which they have. Uh, but they they estimate that they're, like, decent at it because, in a way, they do actually know more than, like, general population, but that doesn't mean that they're masters at it at all. Um, so, yeah. The reason... And sort of a, a broader thing where I wanted to bring this up is... Um, I want to tie this into imposter syndrome a little bit because imposter syndrome is actually sort of the reverse. Um, it's sort of like the right end of this graph wherein the person that's actually good thinks that they will score lower than they actually will. Um, and it's tricky with imposter syndrome because in some cases... I think that people that suffer from imposter syndrome do actually, um, like, they are actually not experts in what their, like, field of study is, but they are actually decent at what, at what their field of study is. Um, and they, their, like, self-perception is that they're really bad um, when, when they're, in fact, decent. They're not experts, but they are, in fact, decent. And... Something that's interesting to me, I don't particularly suffer from imposter syndrome, right? So, I don't know. There are some things where I'm like, yeah, I'm actually good at this. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I don't suffer from that, and particularly in the things that I really care about. But what I do wonder sometimes is I feel like I'm a master at some things, but I'm not sure. Right, which is different. It's notably different from imposter syndrome because imposter syndrome is more like you think that you're bad at something whenever you're um, decent at it. But there are some things in which I think I've achieved a degree of mastery in, but I don't know like at what point I should be proud of it. Right, And in some ways this serves as a way to discredit the things that I do because I like, I'll do something that I'm proud of and I'll think like, well, I don't know if this is actually showing mastery as much as it's showing that I just Googled a bunch of stuff. So I don't know like how much it counts for. Um, but in other days from which other days, when I, which I'm feeling like more confident, I will use it like sort of as a, a point of pride more than I should to say that I am a master of something when really I should just be more sure about it. Um, but yeah, particularly the, the realm in which this happens for me is programming because I have been programming for a very long time. I started programming when I was in middle school. Uh, I started with the my middle school robotics team. Um, I learned programming there from like workshops and I would not stop programming ever. So I've been programming since then. <laughs> um, it's been weekly that I've been programming stuff. So 
Uh, I've been doing it for a long time, and I feel like I know like most things that there are to know about it. Like whenever I think about the realm of computer science, there's lots of like subdivisions. Um, for example, there's like web development or app development. Um, just like server, front end, back end, server management, database management, all that stuff. And I have at least dabbled in every one of those realms that I care to know about, with the exception of cryptography, which I don't touch with the 10 meter pole because uh, I don't like people relying <laughs> that heavily on things that I do. Uh, cryptography is a more of a battlefield than it is a field of research because you are just battling hackers in terms of intelligence. And that's all you do. Um, or at least that's how I perceive it. Uh, cryptography and cybersecurity both. But anyways. Um, so yeah, so I don't know, like, what is the checkbox? What are, what are the tick marks? What are the grades that you need to get to get to yourself a master in something? Like, if you were playing chess, there are, like, literal breakpoints for at what point you become an international master or a grandmaster or a fide master. Uh, but there's not that for most tasks. Like, it, there's no rating for being a programmer, except on, like, I don't know, Stack Overflow. But you know, that's just, like, one website that deems you're good or not. Um, imagine if it were, like, pottery or painting. What determines whether or not you are a master? It's a hard thing to to decide, you know? It's a hard thing to rate those skills. Um, and from that difficulty in rating, it just sort of in introduces a lot of uncertainty. And that uncertainty is frequently like uncomfortable for me because at any time that I feel like I have mastered something, I feel like I'm being prideful and r when really I shouldn't be. But any time that I feel like I haven't mastered something that I wonder if I'm discounting myself. And I just bounce between those two, like the pong ball and pong, <laughs> or a ping pong ball, I guess. Uh, so I don't know. It's just something that I think about a lot. I don't have any solution for it. You know, I, there's no way that I can just draw a line, be like, hey, this is when I've achieved mastery. I do think that in general, it's better to err on the side of assuming mastery. Um, which I think is different from a lot what a lot of people would say, because in general, like societally and socially, it's better to be humble than it is to be proud. Um, that's just because it makes conversations like flow easier when you're not like, look at all the things that I have done, bow before my mighty presence, and then other people are like, I don't like talking to you, go away. <laughs> It's general. In general, it's better to be humble than it is to be prideful. That being said, it's a very different story when you're thinking internally, right? In your own thought process, you don't have to share it with other people, so you're f you're free to be as prideful or as humble as you want to be, as long as it has a, like a positive outcome. Because there are people that like are internally prideful, um, and that reflects negatively upon their actions and upon like their interactions with other people. Uh, but I do think that the reverse is true. There are some people that are internally not prideful and that reflects poorly uh, on, on their actions and what they do. Well, some of the best examples of this are people that like um, have legitimately good ideas, but discount them because they believe that they like aren't, good enough in the field to have had good ideas yet. Uh, and there's like, there's, I mean, there's been uncountably many like ideas for companies that would have legitimately worked, but people were like, eh, I don't know. I don't trust myself enough to like come up with an idea and verify it enough. Um, and it's sort of a shame, you know, cause the world would be a better place if people actually believed in their good ideas and I don't know, we're more sincere about their good ideas. Because I also think that's a big problem is that people, whenever you tell someone like your good idea, more often than not, they're just going to shit on it because it's funny. Then like it's, it's, 
it's very difficult to be sincere because it's very easy to make fun of people that are being sincere, which is an entire another topic that I will definitely cover at some point. But yeah, the the point the point is, I think that internally it's better to err on the side of pridefulness simply because it will give you the confidence to pursue your own like good ideas, right? If you don't immediately discount your ideas because of your humility, then it, it opens up lots of opportunities for you because you can actually use your pride to believe in yourself <laughs> and believe in your own ideas. Um, and, and in that way, I think it's actually beneficial. It does have to be moderated, though, of course, for all the mentions, I, all the, the reasons I mentioned before. Um, but yeah. So I think I think it's better to, in conclusion, I think it's better to err on the side of pride when it comes to considering how good you are at something. Um, and the reasoning for that is that I think it can actually positively benefit the actions that you do and the decisions that you take. So yeah, that's it for today. <laughs>